In 1966, occult showman Anton LaVey founds the Church of Satan in San Francisco. Part religion, part money-making racket, the Church of Satan attracts lurid headlines, mostly encouraged by the publicity-seeking LaVey himself. We believe in greed, we believe in selfishness, we believe in all of the lustful thoughts that motivate man because this is man's natural uh, feeling. He called himself Anton Sander LaVey of Romanian descent, but the truth of the matter is he was Howard Stanton Levy, who was born in Cook County, Illinois in 1930. He held these weekend lectures and witch circles in his house, and people would come in and pay their $2 a head. Well, finally, he had this friend that was a publicist who said, you know, I have an idea. Why don't you turn this thing into a church? You could make a bundle of money. And, of course, that's what he did. He has been called everything from a carny to a manipulator to a brilliant philosopher. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. There were doctors, lawyers, college students, factory workers, farmers, you name it. They came from all levels of society. In spite of the inventive rituals, mostly staged for the cameras, neither LaVey nor his followers believe in a real devil. What LaVey admires is Satan the rebel, the nonconformist, provoking the establishment. Predictably, America is fascinated and outraged. In 1967, the 60s fascination with the occult, spearheaded by LaVey's Church of Satan, gets a powerful boost from Hollywood. The film, Rosemary's Baby, a dark tale of devil worshippers in Manhattan, is a massive and unexpected hit. In Roman Polanski's masterpiece, the heroine's innocuous neighbors are part of a satanic conspiracy to help the Prince of Darkness father a child who will rule the world. In Rosemary's Baby, Satan triumphs in the end. But the Christian backlash to the story comes in the 1973 blockbuster, The Exorcist. This time, the devil, who has possessed a young girl, is defeated by the forces of good in the shape of two priests. The old belief that women are especially susceptible to satanic influence is revived two centuries after the Salem witch trials. We would be seriously in error if we were to underestimate the power of Hollywood. I think the, the, the biggest impact was probably around the, um, the time of the, the Exorcist. I know many people I've talked to about the movie, especially those raised in a Christian household, who are very frightened by it, very upset. It's the war between good and evil, but evil is in a whole new dimension, and it's very personal. It, it made being possessed almost fashionable. It's the, the, the numbers of people who were seen to be possessed just took off. I've been invited to exorcise uh, people who were convinced they had a demon, uh, and you will, you will get people who will put them through it, um, and it can be very violent and very dramatic and, and very expressive, but it can really flip someone into serious, serious ill health. Hollywood's discovery that fortunes can be made with stories of possession and devil worship stokes the fires of a paranoia that has lain dormant since the days of the witch trials. In the 1980s, stories about a vast conspiracy of organized Satanists sweep the media. Known as the Satanic Panic, Christian groups allege mass Satanic abuse of children and tens of thousands of kidnappings. Part of the satanic panic started with accusations of satanic ritual abuse. Groups of people who declared themselves as Satanists were believed to be taking people and children and damaging them. There were all kinds of dark suggestions about children disappearing and about child sacrifice and ritual murder. Although hundreds of people are arrested and imprisoned, when the FBI finally launches a full-scale investigation in the United States, it concludes that the satanic abuse allegations are all 
groundless. One of the horrifying things about human nature is that it lends itself to hysteria. Uh, you, you get it in all periods of history. I think you get it much more virulently nowadays because uh, one of the most potent instruments for spreading hysteria is the modern telecommunications industry. If members of satanic religions mostly don't believe in a supernatural devil and don't pray to Satan, what does the devil represent? Some Satanists claim the devil stands for a spirit of change. A lot of people are frightened by the term Satanism. A lot of people automatically think that Satanists are bad people. They should be no more scared of a Satanist than they should be scared of anyone else they meet. You know, what Satanism means to me is opposition and balance. Alternative thought, playing the devil's advocate. There is no good and evil. I mean, to a mouse, a cat is this horrible evil thing with fangs. But to the pet owner, the cat is heavenly. We create our own reality. That's the whole idea behind Satanism. In the United States, surveys show that almost half of Americans believe the devil is real. Even non-religious people instinctively divide the world into good and evil. The opposing principles taught by Zoroaster to the ancient Persians. If anything, recent events have made that belief even stronger. In September 2001, the massive terrorist attacks on the United States which destroyed the World Trade Center shocked America to its core. To many, it seemed as if sinister forces had gone on the offensive. It was easy to believe that this was a showdown between the forces of good and evil. To the US government and a large section of American opinion, the attacks were about much more than politics. We've come to know truths that we will never question. Evil is real, and it must be opposed. You're either with us or you're against us. And if you're against us, by and large, you're going to be working hand in hand with Satan. It was Reagan that talked about the evil empire. Bush talks about the axis of evil. It's classic, ancient, dualistic thinking. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, President Bush gave the job of catching Osama bin Laden, the man responsible for the atrocity, to Lieutenant General William G. Boykin. But according to Boykin, America's real foe isn't bin Laden. In the general's words, the enemy of the US is a guy called Satan. Since 2001, the draconian measures taken by the U.S. and other governments in the War on Terror are uncannily like those of the War on Satan of 400 years ago. Imprisonment without trial, secret hearings, anonymous tip-offs, and torture. We are seeing a similar willingness to, to justify mistreatment, to justify the, um, the removal of rights, the justifiable use of torture, against the perceived enemy in the war against terrorism. If you're fighting a war against evil, what begins to happen, I think, is that you end up by turning into the evil that you're fighting. Controversially, President Bush called the invasion of Iraq a crusade. The similarities with the historic crusades against heretics are striking. They include a belief on the battlefield that the enemy are not just military opponents, but agents of pure evil. In November 2004, as US forces launch a massive attack on the Iraqi city of Fallujah, a senior Marine officer, Lieutenant Colonel Gareth Brandle, makes clear who he thinks the enemy is. The enemy has got a face. He's called Satan. We're going to destroy it. It's embroidery, it's myth-making, it's poetry. It can be good fun, except that 
it has produced great evils. A human invention, but one that's rebounded on us because it's given us permission uh, to do terrible things to each other. Which is why I think that we should close hell down and finally banish the devil and get rid of him.